Hello, everyone. Welcome. And uh, so up next, we have Python Data Sonification for Science and Discovery by Erin Broswell. Please help me welcome her to the stage. Hello. Thank you for coming. So, numbers really have a story to tell. And one of the things that I find most interesting about that is that a lot of that story is really, really up to the person who's doing the storytelling. So it's not um, those numbers themselves, but they really can be interpreted depending on how you want to interpret them. So before I was a uh, developer, which happened relatively recently, I did a lot of astronomy outreach and education. And one of the things that we did was encourage kids to take their own astronomical pictures and then process them from start to finish. So that is everything from taking the pictures with the microobservatory telescopes, which are these tiny little six-inch telescopes. Some of them were in Arizona, some of them in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And then process those images just like real data science um, image processors do at NASA. So that is everything from processing them the traditional way, which is images that were taken with a red filter, uh, color them red, with a green filter, color them green, and with a blue filter, color them blue, and then put them all together till you get a full color image. And this image was actually taken from the microobservatory telescopes and processed by a professional image processor. And so it really is a lot of finesse. It's, a lot, it's not just you know, click buttons and it happens. There's a lot of um, massaging the numbers and massaging the different parameters to try to get it to look the way that it does. So even with you know, not great data, you can still make it look really great. And so one of the things we encouraged the kids to do was not just do that standard process, you know, red, green, blue, full color image. Um, have fun with it. Like over process it, under process it, add crazy colors, do different things with it. And it's still that exact same data is just displayed in a way that you wouldn't really expect and in a way that was more personal to them, to the people who were doing the processing and therefore trying to tell a story with that. So getting to <laughs> the sonification part. So sonification really is just a different way of exploring that exact same data. So Wikipedia defines sonification as the use of non-speech audio to convey information or perceptualize data. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So one of the most famous examples of sonification is the Geiger counter. So the Geiger counter, what that is, is essentially it's a tube that's filled with gas, and that gas has high voltage going through it. And whenever a radioactive particle comes in contact with that gas, it, uh, the ga gas uh, conducts electricity, and that causes ionization, which is basically just a change in electrical charge. And that ionization is detected by the Geiger counter, which then emits a little click and also shows up on the audio display. And that is super useful for anyone using it because they can get that feedback right in the moment they need it and not necessarily um, after the fact. You go back to the data, the lab and analyze the data and find it there or by staring at a display the whole time. You get the, display, you get the feedback in real time with audio. So... Um, scientists also study volcanoes, <laughs> and volcanoes have a lot of data associated with it. You have seismic data, you have um, emissions data, uh, you have GPS data. So there's a team in sci of scientists who studied this particular volcano, the Soufriere uh, Hills volcano in Montserrat, and they studied it over a long period of time, and that was between in the 2000, 2005 to 2007, I think is what it was, and essentially um, produced a track, of a soundtrack <laughs> for this study that had three different types of data on it. There was a seismic track, and that measures the number of earthquakes per day. And so the greater number of the earthquakes, the more intense, like kind of like the bass sound. The sulfur dioxide track, which represents the number of tons of sulfur dioxide emitted every single day in this study. And then also uh, GPS data, 
which they basically put GPS sensors on the sides of the volcano, and when they moved apart from each other, there was um, a certain sound, and when they moved towards each other, there was a different sound. So I'm going to play that for you right now. So we'll see what it sounds like. So there was just a little clip. There's a lot more to that. It's, it's pretty cool. I think it, uh, Shauna pointed out that it was like the, the background for a really scary volcano movie. It's like perfect. <laughs> So sometimes sonification can be taken super literally. So this is the black hole. Um, I think it, oh shoot, I wrote it down. This is a black hole. <laughs> it's in the Perseus cluster. And um, so what's going on there is as the black hole is sucking things in, it has what's called an accretion disk of matter that's just surrounding that black hole. And there are also what are called relativistic jets. They're just really big bursts of energy going out of both the north and the south pole of that black hole. And because those relativistic jets are so energetic, they are vibrating the matter in that, in that accretion disk. And that is causing the accretion disk to make a sound because sound is really just vibration passing through, uh, passing through a medium. And so um, that particular... Uh, that particular vibration is a tone of B-flat, uh, <laughs> 57 octaves below middle C, or a million billion times lower than the lowest sound audible to the human ear. So it's not something that we can actually listen to, but it's something that you can still measure and see out there, which is pretty cool. So uh, I also, in my past job, had the pleasure of working with um, an astrophysicist named Wanda diaz Marced, and she did a lot of research on black holes and stars and forming stars, but she lost her sight in her early 20s. And so a big focus of her research has been um, how to use data sonification to not only help her and other blind astronomers, but also help other people who can see maybe interpret the data better and get a little bit of a different perspective. So she used a lot of open source tools and code to turn data into sound with um, parameters such as pitch, duration, and other properties like direction, like panning, and also volume. And so she actually, when she was doing this study with uh, stellar radio data, she found that people who were able to see the graphs actually were able to detect patterns a little more easily when listening to the audio and looking at the graph at the same time when you're talking about large, large, large data sets. And she's actually given a TED talk about this and it's super interesting. You should check it out. There's a link where you can find out. You can watch that video. It's really great. So the other thing that Wanda did was she was studying um, binary stars. And so there's a white dwarf star and there's a star, a smaller star around it and they're both orbiting around each other. And as the white dwarf is orbiting, because it's more massive, it actually sucks mass off of the other star. And that also causes, radio, uh, causes transfer of a lot of energy. And that causes um, gamma ray bursts at irregular intervals that are, have different certain frequencies that are kind of in the same, in the similar pattern. So Wanda was translating those frequencies into pitches, and she actually had it um, out on her desk uh, and a colleague walked in. So first, before I continue the story, so here's what the, um, the sound sounded like, just straight frequency to pitch. So um, our colleague walked in and happened to be a jazz musician and recognized that rhythm immediately as what's called the clave rhythm. And so his cousin was a jazz, um, jazz composer and he sent, essentially transposed it to uh, music notation and sent it off to his cousin. 
and they came up with this. Isn't that great? <laughs> Love it. So translating more to the code and Python side of things, one of the most famous, I think, examples of sonification is listen to Wikipedia. Has anyone ever gone to that site and seen that? It is fantastic, and you should definitely go check it out. Um, essentially what it is, it's a, both a sonification and a visualization of what is going on at Wikipedia right now. And it is so cool because it really proves this point that Wikipedia is this living, breathing, ever-evolving document with people editing things all over the world constantly. And so whenever someone edits a page, there's a little dot and also a sound associated with it. And whenever a new user joins, there's this really big kind of overarching, like, ah, oh. it's really cool. And I definitely encourage you to check it out. It's really neat. So uh, one of my roommates and my friend Steve, uh, he created a Python library to do this in science, to do use sonification in science that he was doing. So they were studying mice, and these mice would make sounds, but they were ultrasonic sounds. They were really, really high. No, you couldn't actually hear them. And so they originally tried translating the sounds down and just trying to play it back along with the video of the mice doing things. And that didn't work so well because it... They still couldn't really distinguish between the different sounds because they were not mice. They did not understand mice language. So what they did instead was uh, Steve created um, a library that used machine learning to first figure out what the different pitches that the mice were making were and then translate those pitches into sounds that were more easily distinguishable by humans. So uh, like different notes on a scale so that when playing that back with the video, they could tell exactly what the mouse was saying and exactly what was going on in the video when that happened. So with that, we're going to translate over to a Jupyter Notebook, and we're going to do some live uh, visualizations and also some sonifications of that data. So this notebook is up um, for anyone to go up and use. Uh, I'll have a link to where you can find it later if you're interested. Uh, these first couple cells are really boring. They are just uh, doing some data processing and some uh, showing, like a scaling. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we're going to start with this one. Ooh. So we're going to start out with some really simple data. And so uh, we're going to just literally just define it as a list of tuples. And that will show up as a scatter plot. I'll try to make this a little smaller. So hopefully, yeah, perfect. So the other thing, okay. So with that scatter plot, without getting into the details of what's going on, we're just going to play it. <laughs> Yay! Okay, good. <laughs> That's a good sign. So how exactly are we converting those numbers? right into notes that are being played from the graph. So we're using something called MIDI, which stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And MIDI is just amazing. It can do so many different things across so many different applications. And so essentially what it is is encoded messages that have to do with pitch, timing, duration, volume, um, pan, and also can be used to control a wide variety of different devices that are all um, being synchronized over MIDI because it has like a pretty great clock that lets you internal like sync lots of different things. And so at the heart of turning numbers into pitches, this is big chart that essentially just has at the top it has musical notes, and on the left hand side it has the different octaves or the different um, the different levels of pitch that it can be for each one of those notes. And there's a couple different standards. So the one that I'm using right now is uh, middle C, so it's C60. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this guy right here. Uh, C3, which is like middle C right on the keyboard, is set to the note to the number 60, and everything kind of goes from there. So 
as you can imagine, Python has so many great resources for dealing with, mi uh, with MIDI and with music. And so I found something very helpful, the Python and Music Wiki, which is great. It has so much information in it, if you're interested. Um, so for this talk, I'll be using a little library called Sonify, some code that I wrote that will take Python, essentially just a list of tuples, or a list of list of tuples for multi-track data, and turn that into MIDI. And the, main, the two main components of that are um, MIDI util, which is a library that creates MIDI files, and also playing back that MIDI also with Python, surprisingly with Pygame. I guess not surprisingly, since with games you want a soundtrack a lot of times. So Pygame has a lot of really great MIDI functionality built into it. So since we're in Cleveland, and since it's the middle of NBA playoffs, thought it would be good to take a look at some basketball stats. So we're going to take a look at the Cleveland Cavaliers' regular season win percentage. So first off, we're going to load up some data. And there are some specific points in this, uh, in this list of tuples to pay attention to, namely when LeBron joins, and then when he goes to Miami, and then when he comes back to Cleveland. We'll see what that sounds like. So we'll go ahead, and a lot of this is behind the scenes. If you're interested to see how these plots are made, those uh, functions are defined earlier up in the notebook. They're there for you. So here we have the graph. So we see LeBron's look rookie year. Things start to do a little better. Then they do really well. And then he leaves for Miami, so it goes down a little bit. <laughs> and then when he comes back, they start doing great again. So what we're going to do is a little bit of processing to get those percentages and those numbers into a form that we can play back with MIDI. And so the first thing we do is separate out the X and the Y. And then so the X can be used for the timing. And that's just going to be the second year in the season. And the Y is going to be that note value. So we have to scale that those original values to be in that range of, that we saw earlier between 0 and 127. And because 0 is pretty low, so um, uh, it's, it's a little bit too low for us to hear. So we're going to stick in the range between 30 and 127. And then we'll just stick it all back together. And so here is what that looks like, a lot like our earlier graph. And then we can go ahead and listen to that. So another cool thing you can do with MIDI is you can specify certain parameters. So you can specify what instrument you want it to play back with. So there's a standard, uh, there's a standard list of all of the instruments and what program or channel they correspond to, which are just different uh, parameters on a MIDI track. And you can also, um, with Sonify, you can specify which key you'd like it to be played back in. So essentially what that is, is we saw that big chart of all of the numbers. With a key, only some of those numbers really matter, are the ones that are really um, the important ones. And <laughs> so for the key of G major, it's all of the natural notes plus F sharp. So it's going to be all of those natural notes plus F sharp. So what it's going to do is it's going to snap those Y values to the closest number that fits within that particular key. So let's hear what it sounds like. That was nice. So now we're going to talk about um, climate change data. And this is from uh, climate.gov. And this graph essentially shows what they call, hang on, they have a really fancy name for it, yearly average temperature anomalies. So what they do is they compare the average temperature of both the land and the ocean over the entire 20th century, and then compare that to every single year in that time period to see if any particular year was colder or warmer than that average. 
So we're going to open that uh, JSON file. It was in a JSON file on climate.gov, which was fantastic. I was so excited about that. <laughs> and then um, do some processing of that file and come up with a scatter plot, again, in that same range between uh, 30 and 127, so we can take a listen to it. And so let's go ahead. Kind of spooky. <laughs> so our final data exploration, we're going to look at some exoplanet data. So exoplanets are planets that are going around other stars. And so for uh, this section, all of this is taken from another Jupiter notebook from a fantastic astronomer named Gert Berenstein. And he goes through all of the data analysis in this notebook in a lot of detail. So if you're interested in this particular part of it, please take a look and go through that notebook. It is so great. So what is Kepler doing when it gathers data? Essentially what it's doing is gathering data about how bright a star is at any particular time. And it takes just a lot of pictures of that star. And what they're looking for is a dip in that brightness that is caused by a planet going between the telescope and the star to make it kind of go down in brightness. So what the data file um, looks like is essentially just a measure of how bright that star was at a lot of different timestamps. So let's actually take a look at one of those star images. And that error comes up the first time, but it goes away the second time, so haha. Uh, <laughs> so that's what that image looks like. It's just this really little, little image. Um, and if we take a look at the shape of it, of that entire image file, we know that there are 926 images, um, and they're all 9 by 7 pixels. So they're really small little images. And so because um, Gert has already done all of the hard work for us, we know that the period of brightness actually repeats in a cycle over a period of 0.8 days. So we can plot that in 0.8 day chunks, and we can just see what that pattern looks like. And so it does indeed look like there's a steady brightness, and then it dips, and then it goes back up. And so what we're going to do with Sonify is we're going to add each one of those separate observations onto the same graph. And then we'll scale it in the same range so it makes sense to play back with MIDI data. So here's our exoplanet graph of all of those points. And so we'll go ahead and play it. Kind of chaotic, but kind of cool. So why don't we try to clean that up a little bit? We're going to play each separate light curve as a new track. And we'll go ahead and add a rhythm, because why not? Because that's fun. So we're going to modify this MIDI file in much the same way that we have done with all of our other data. So the first thing we do is separate that out into separate tracks. So each one of those colors is each one of those periods of observation. And we're going to cut it down only to five, just for a little bit less stuff going on. And we're going to specify which, one, which instrument we'd like to use for each one of those original tracks. Um, I've picked these particular ones. Um, and then what we're going to do is go ahead and add each one of those, uh, those tracks to our MIDI file. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and get all of the beats that are in our MIDI file and add just a kick drum to the downbeat, just to give it a little bit of a groove. So let's hear what that sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> so
So where do you go from here if you were interested in using MIDI to interpret your data? As I said before, Python has so much going on. Uh, there's so many great resources for you to use. Um, if you would like a little list of them, you can visit them at this URL right here. And it also has um, my contact information and uh, lots of other stuff. And also these slides and a link to the GitHub repo with all of the code if you would like to check it out. So it's uh, a tradition in my office to write a haiku at the end of your presentation that kind of summarizes everything. So here's mine. Here's my haiku. So thank you so much for having me. I, this has been a dream come true and so, such a pleasure. Um, I don't think I have time for questions, but if anyone would like to talk to me, here's my email address, here's my Twitter, and please come up and talk to me about music or data or astronomy or pretty much anything. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Aaron.